Our brigade belonged to the 6th Corps of Lieutenant General Essen II. In Nesvish, we lived splendidly, not thinking about the French. Few of our officers preoccupied themselves with politics. We occasionally heard political news from local newspapers, but quickly forgot about it in the clatter of our carefree daily life. Only one man, N, one of our non-commissioned officers, an intelligent man who read both the scripture and the Moscow newspapers, was horrified by Napoleon. Tormented by the ghosts of his imagination, he began to preach to us that the Antichrist, Apollyon, or Napoleon, had brought together great evil forces near Warsaw for no other purpose but to destroy our mother Russia, that with the help of Satan Beelzebub, the enemy would inevitably capture Moscow and conquer the entire Russian nation, and soon thereafter the world would face Judgment Day. We laughed at such absurdities, which greatly annoyed N, who called us godless. Constantly imbibing tobacco, he did his best to persuade us, and kept referring to the ninth chapter of Revelations, which, he said, described Napoleon as the leader of the dreaded army, with lion's teeth, breastplates of iron, and scorpion's tails. Afterwards, we were quite surprised when the French did invade Russia and occupied Moscow. France under Napoleon was stronger than Russia. His vast army stood at our very frontiers. Most people were convinced of the invincibility of Napoleon. What kind of a Russian would not have been terrified to see this invincible colossus ready to invade his beloved motherland? Such emotional anguish could certainly produce visions and imaginary revelations, which were then partially confirmed by subsequent events. We celebrated New Year's Eve 1811 with dances indulging ourselves with sweet sentimentality under a pleasant haze of intoxication. Older officers were frightened of Napoleon, seeing him as a terrible conqueror, the new Attila, while we, the young, happily frolicked under Cupid's gaze. And then, our lives were interrupted by the thunderous roar of war. We were told to prepare for a campaign. Alas, farewell our sweet Panienkas. If only Napoleon knew how spirited and eager the Russians were to fight his forces, then he would not have entertained the futile hope of conquering Russia. The French forces which had been accustomed to victories were at least twice as large as ours, while what can be said about their leader if not that the history of modern times has never seen anyone like him, with good fortune or the ability to win. Napoleon could be defeated only with his own weapon to adopt his political system and the manner of waging war. And so, the weaker side had to turn to a military stratagem, to retreat step by step in front of a stronger enemy, lure him deeper and deeper into the woods and marshes, where the lack of supplies, exhaustion from prolonged marches, and harshness of climate would have so weakened him that the weaker side could dare attacking the defenseless enemy. Our commander-in-chief was determined to repulse enemy attacks from the northern direction, so as to allow for an unimpeded union with the second army. It seemed, therefore, that he was ready to give battle. At dawn, we broke camp. The soldiers crossed themselves to ensure a good start and moved forward with resolution. As soon as we reached the Ostrov road, we heard the sound of gunfire at some distance. Our advance guard was already in action. The closer we came to the battlefield marching along the side of the main road, the clearer we heard the sound of gunfire. The sense of a nearby battle, the first one in my life, took over. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Question, why is Christmas Day on December 25th? A, it was the same day as the Roman festival for Sol Invictus. B. It was nine months after Jesus' supposed day of conception. Or C. It was chosen to weaken the pagan festival of Mithra. And the answer is, we don't know. All three are possible. And so, my recommendation this week is one of Magellan's new documentaries, which they add every week. The American Saint Nick of World War II is a heartwarming tale of optimism in the direst circumstances. The return of Christmas cheer to an occupied small town in Luxembourg by American troops. 
a great historical Christmas treat. And of course, Magellan have more than 3,000 other documentaries to check out too. And this Christmas, Voices of the Past viewers can take advantage of a special holiday offer. Buy one, get one free gift cards for an annual membership by clicking on the link in the description. Thanks. About one Versta from the battlefield, we were ordered to stop and prepare for battle. Infantrymen began loading their muskets and the rattle of ramrods soon filled the air. Artillerymen prepared ammunition while officers drew their swords. I still had no clear idea about what a battle was. I believed that everybody converging on a battlefield was destined to perish, that each cannonball or bullet would invariably kill or wound a man and therefore I would probably not survive this fight. But seeing how bravely everyone around me marched onwards, I had no other choice but to follow their example. Passing by me, our artillery brigade commander saw me sitting quietly on a gun carriage and said, Keep resting, lad. The real work will soon begin. These were his last words, because as soon as he reached the battlefield, an enemy cannonball shattered his chest, and traversing through it, melted both his heart and gold coins that were inside his pocket. When the cannonballs began to whistle above our heads and cut men from our ranks, the infantry rushed forward while the artillery trotted behind. The skirmishers scattered in brushwood, batteries were set up and the fight ensued. The enemy batteries engaged us from three sides. Their cannonballs hopped all around us like rabbits. Dead soldiers lay on the road. One of them had his head torn off. Another had his stomach ripped apart, while a third lay without legs. My heart convulsed at their sight and an uncomfortable feeling took over. I became faint-hearted and felt weakness in my knees. Veteran soldiers observe that fear disturbs the heart of a young soldier only before a battle begins, because his thoughts still consider the deathly horrors that leave a bad impression. But once he's in the midst of a battle, fear is eclipsed by rage. As he puts his life in danger, a soldier ceases to be an observer and becomes an active participant and death ceases to frighten him. His heart fills with blood and he disregards danger, turning into a seemingly insensitive being. I was in such a condition when our cannons were ordered to deploy the designated spot. Suddenly, cannonballs began to whistle by me. One of them hit a horse artilleryman, while another sheared off a cannoneer's legs. Together with his cartridge pouch, he fell in front of me and wretchedly cried, Save me, your honour. Moments earlier, I had shuddered at seeing the dead, but I became callous and simply ordered my men to drag him to the side so he did not interfere with our operations. In the deafening din of cannonade and gunpowder, I kept losing my concentration. The enemy cannonballs mercilessly ravaged the infantry behind me, so I decided to repay them by turning my fire against the enemy columns that had been moving forward along the main road, and fired ricochet shots so successfully that they immediately disordered the enemy infantry and forced it to halt. Meanwhile, my gunners had ran out of ammunition. I took a horse and galloped to find our company commander to ask him for a new cannon and ammunition. But alas, I was astounded by the condition of our artillery on the right side of the road. Several guns were scattered around, damaged or overturned, and dead gunners and horses lay among them. Eventually I found our lieutenant colonel amidst great commotion. Upon seeing me, he asked, You are still alive, I replied. As you can see, just give me a gun and ammunition. What else, lad, he continued. Our entire company is shattered. Goryanov is captured. Schlippenbach and Braiko have lost their legs. The lieutenant colonel then approached Count Osterman and began to report to him that the company lost many men killed and that there were quite a few damaged cannon that could no longer be employed. What will you command of me, your grace? He finally inquired. The Count, sniffing tobacco, replied curtly, Fire from the cannon that are still functional. Meanwhile, someone informed the Count that the enemy cannonballs claimed many lives in the infantry and suggested moving them back to safety. No, hold ground and die, the Count sternly replied. A third aide soon approached and wanted to say something to the Count when a cannonball ripped off his hand which flew by the Count. Take care of him, said the Count. 
and turned his horse. The unshakable presence of mind in a commander at a moment when everything was in disarray all around him was a genuine manifestation of the Russian character. Looking at him, we all gained courage from his example and returned to our places, ready to die. I was pleased to see the damage my cannon caused the enemy. Naturally, this is the only time one is allowed to enjoy the evil one inflicts on fellow humans, who willingly or not had become our enemies. I diligently aimed the cannon for another salvo, and just as I stepped back to see how well the sight was set, an enemy cannonball suddenly appeared as a black dot out of dense smoke and flew towards me. It was supposed to be a death blow, but my inner sense or self-preservation instinct pushed me back towards the gun. I stumbled and the cannonball knocked me over. Soldiers rushed to me, and placing me on their muskets carried me behind the front line. I thought that I had my legs blown off and dared not look at them. I felt my right leg might be shattered around my foot area, but I could still use my left leg, so I found a thick branch to prop myself up, and standing up with some difficulty, I slowly moved towards the road. Throughout this journey, I did not dare to look at my right leg and struggled to drag it along, yet pain was intensifying, and soon it spread along my entire leg. I felt a burning sensation as if I was on fire. Reaching our supply train, I found our brigade treasurer, who advised me to get immediately into a hearse that was taking the wounded to Tolmin, our divisional officer. This poor lad had his right arm ripped off above the elbow. Climbing onto the hearse, I finally decided to look at my foot, and was thrilled to see that only the rear side of my boot was broken and burnt as if by fire. The cannonball would have certainly severed my leg if not for my instinct that saved me. Our company suffered considerable losses in this battle. We lost up to 60 cannoneers and some 30 horses. Four cannons had their carriages and wheels damaged, one officer was captured and three wounded. The Polish lancers, formed by Prince Radziwiłł, inflicted severe damage to us, but the prince himself was wounded during the attack when he was shot in the leg by our canister. On the eve of war, when we were quartered in Nezvish, the prince was a frequent visitor at our camp. We even visited his estate to attend two magnificent balls that he had organised. Who would have thought that circumstances would drive us apart, turn us into enemies, and compel us to inflict such harm on each other? On the 14th of July, the town's surgeons showed up as promised, and this time they brought their instruments with them. At that moment, I found them more terrifying than the French cavalry. The lead surgeon's blue coat, powdered wig and long nose appeared to me as nightmares for several nights in a row. The surgeon asked, Well, how are you? I was terrified, and, hiding my leg, I replied, I am doing well, sir, there is no need to cut me. Let us see, he replied, and I did not dare to resist. My deformed heel was swollen, all blue, and seemed to be covered by the Antonov fire. The surgeons in glasses carefully examined and touched it, then talked among themselves in Latin. The powdered wig seemed undecided whether to cut my leg or not. I confess that at that moment, the esteemed surgeon standing with his curved knife in front of me seemed to be more terrifying than Napoleon. I could read the sentence of life or death on his wrinkly forehead since I did not think my weak health would allow me to survive the operation. Fortunately, because of the Latin's unanimous verdict, the curved knife was set aside, and instead a small pen knife appeared in front of me. As I was turned over, the surgeons grabbed my leg tight and suddenly struck my swollen heel with a knife. I screamed with pain, but then felt relieved. The wound was full of thickened blood that accumulated under the skin, and its bluish hue looked like the Antonov fire, which raised the surgeon's suspicion. Thus, my foot was spared, after being so close to being severed from my body. I was thrilled I was not left disabled. I raved about treachery and traitors and my feverish mind imagined the abominable Napoleon as a supernatural being protected by infernal forces. 
I had visions of the red hussars in bearskin hats galloping straight at me with their swords drawn, as well as of skinny, tanned Italian skirmishers finding their way through brushwood like hyenas and aiming their deadly weapons at me. Thus, the horrors I experienced before seemed now so much livelier. I had to cover my face with my hands so as to avoid seeing these ghosts, shuddering at imagining the demise of Russia. Suffering from high fever, I could not make any observations for several days. After the retreat, which lasted nearly two months, our troops needed rest and fresh food. Rumours claimed that the enemy army was suffering deficiencies in everything and was exhausted from never-ending marches through devastated country. Such news thrilled us. The rumours claimed that there was unrest in Napoleon's army, that his troops were no longer willing to march any deeper into the land of the Scythians. But the haughtiness and arrogance of the captured Frenchmen certainly didn't confirm it. They were far from being discouraged, and instead told us that we would all soon suffer the fate of falling into captivity. Such was their confidence in the invincibility of Napoleon. On the 1st of August, I returned to my company. I was partially recovered from my wound, which had not fully healed yet. My leg was wrapped in bandages, and I had to use crutches to move around. I felt awkward everywhere, suffered from pain, and as people say, all of this was not to my liking. On the 2nd of August, our troops marched forward 15 versters, deploying in a valley in front of Kasplia Lake. The fields were full of ripe grain that was so tall it reached above soldiers' waists, and we felt pity knowing that this scenic place would be trampled by soldiers pitching camp, thereby eradicating the fruits of peasants' hard labour. The 5th of August proved to be a fateful day for the city and bloody for the contending armies. The artillery fire from both sides was murderous. The battle reached its climax during the evening. The cumulative horrors of fighting turned indescribable. Hundreds of cannonballs and grenades whistled through the air and burst, one after another. The air above the city darkened from smoke. The earth groaned and it seemed that it disgorged hellish fires from deep inside. Death itself struggled to consume all of its victims. The enemy grenades ignited fires inside the city, which embodied a new, hellish vision for us. A battle in the midst of raging fire. As we stood on the bank of the river, looking at the blazing city, an instinctive tremor of the heart revealed to us that we were still too weak to face our powerful enemy. From there on, the French pursuit eased off as the most recent fights had cooled their ardour. Besides, it was said that Napoleon was still at Smolensk, pondering what to do next. The dust and heat were intolerable. For several versters back and forth, one could not see anything but artillery and baggage trains, moving in dense clouds of dust that kept rising to the sky. We walked as if shrouded in fog, the sun seemed purple, and neither the greenery by the side of the road nor the paint on the gun carriages could be discerned. Soldiers were covered from head to toe in grey dust, and our faces and hands were black from dust and sweat. As the heat tormented us with thirst, we couldn't find any refreshments. In such miserable conditions, we happened to pass by a crowd of French prisoners who had been captured in the last battle and were happy to see us hastily retreating. They mockingly told us that we would not get away from Napoleon, because they now made up the vanguard of his army. I must admit that our soldiers became very disheartened after the battle at Smolensk. The blood that had been shed in the ruins of Smolensk, all the effort made to resist the enemy as well as retreating on the Moscow road into the depths of Russia itself, had made each and every one of us feel powerless against our terrible conqueror. Burning villages were behind and all around us, announcing the approaching French troops. The Cossacks destroyed everything that was left behind, following the passage of our troops, so that the enemy only found barren and desolate land everywhere. Thus, desperate Russia tormented her own womb.
On the 22nd of August, our troops passed through the village of Borodino. It was here that we first saw the Russian peasants armed with pikes and muskets, which they barely knew how to hold. The Russians did not have sufficient forces. We had up to 115,000 regular troops, 7,000 Cossacks, 10,000 Opolchenye, and 640 guns. The French had 190,000 of their best troops and up to 1,000 guns. However, our disparity in numbers was evened out by our love for the fatherland and our thirst for vengeance. Remembering the former glory of victorious Russian arms, each soldier burned with impatience to engage the enemy so that their blood could wash away the humiliation that all of us had suffered. The French had also prepared for battle, except that they were not inspired by a love for their fatherland, but only by their ravenousness for plunder and glory of conquest. They had gone too far into Russia and sought victory to save themselves, as well as to preserve the honour of their arms. They had suffered great hardships, experiencing hitherto unheard of deprivation. If defeated, they faced inevitable destruction, but if they emerged victorious, pleasant prospects flattered their ambition. Moscow lay open before them, beyond the battlefield. Thus, the fate of Napoleon's Grand Army would be decided on the field of Borodino. This army was supported by almost all of Europe, with the French, Germans, Italians, Spaniards, Poles all ready to follow any whims of that extraordinary man, and either win or die. And die they did. The day of preparation for the terrible battle seemed fleeting. The complete silence that reigned in both armies was a harbinger of impending horrors. How many thousands of future victims of human enmity still enjoyed life that day, only to turn to dust the following. Thus, a man is destined to remain the plaything of passions, to reach for the heavens with his mind, and to disappear in earthly irrelevance. The sun shone brightly and glided its golden rays over the fatal steel of our bayonets and muskets. It sparkled with brilliant light on the copper of our guns. Everything was getting ready for bloodshed on the morrow. In short, 300,000 men from both armies were preparing for the great, terrible day. As the sun rose at dawn, numerous guns, howitzers and lickhorns erupted into a ferocious cannonade all along the line between the left flank and the centre. The cannon fire was so frequent that there were no lulls in the explosions that continued incessantly, resembling a thunder and producing a man-made earthquake. Thick clouds of smoke curling around the batteries ascended to heaven and soon obscured the sun which became veiled in a bloody shroud as if affected by human rage and ferocity. Standing on the right flank, I long remained a quiet spectator of this spectacle and stood silently next to my gun, expecting orders to join the battle at any moment. The enemy cannonballs reached us in leaps and bounds or rolling on the ground. Shells exploded in the air, scattering numerous splinters while making a terrifying noise. The crimson sun, having dipped its last ray of light in the blood of so many dead, disappeared over the horizon, as if shuddering from the terrible slaughter that unfolded beneath it. Darkness descended on the field of death, and the gunpowder smoke and stench enveloped the vast battlefield in a heavy mist. Thus ended the famous battle of the 26th of August. Despite the enemy's numerical superiority, the Russians had never before fought with such ferocity as on this momentous occasion. They steadfastly endured all the damage inflicted by cannonballs and bullets, spreading death in the enemy ranks while suffering equally at their hands. Napoleon let us withdraw to Mozhaisk without attempting any pursuit which once again demonstrated that he had broken his teeth on us and was seemingly content with the battlefield that was left to him to witness the immense casualties 
that his forces had suffered. And so, on the 30th of August, we arrived at a fortified camp established around the village of Mamanova, some 19 versters from Moscow. Picturesque hills crowned with groves and beautiful manor houses were half visible above the treetops, signalling that we were already in the environs of our ancient capital. As we approached the heart of the Russian realm, we bowed our heads, ashamed to look at the golden-domed mother city that could not be protected from destruction. Some feeble minds embraced the idea of Napoleon's supernatural abilities. He was widely cursed in the churches, and some even claimed that his name was mentioned in the Book of Revelation. Many Russian warriors, who loathed the horrors of death, were becoming physically and mentally distressed. We expected that there would be a decisive battle, more ferocious even than Borodino. But circumstances produced a rather different and unexpected outcome. Feelings woken by the sight of the perishing capital, as well as by the hatred felt towards our enemy, excited my imagination that one morning I experienced a genuinely patriotic dream. I dreamt that I somehow found myself disguised as a Frenchman in the enemy camp. I took a pistol out of my pocket and shot the general from the side. The bullet pierced his chest and the general fell to the ground. But as he did, he turned to face me. And to my grief, I saw that it was not Napoleon. Ugh, it's Murat, I exclaimed, as I was grasped by officers who would certainly have shot me if I didn't wake up. Meanwhile, the headquarters held a council of war attended by the senior generals. The field marshal made the decision to withdraw his troops and abandon Moscow to the French, so they could perish there. Only Field Marshal Prince Kutuzov, the genuine son of Russia who suckled on her breasts, could surrender the ancient capital of the empire without a fight. Public opinion would have condemned any other commander as an apparent traitor. Our retreat was conducted in an orderly fashion, but surrounded by dreary silence. Approaching the bereaved capital, the mother of all Russian cities, our soldiers gazed with broken hearts at beautiful buildings that were abandoned to the enemy. The Kremlin, with its Gothic towers, the vast and ancient palaces of the Russian Tsars, and the golden-domed Ivan the Great, about to become silent witnesses to impending calamities. Everything was now sacrificed to the enemy. And all the while, thousands of Russians fled with their arms in their hands. We passed by the Kremlin and entered the city, where we saw misery, crying and despair everywhere. Officers began to gather in groups to discuss what would happen next, since none of us knew what to expect. Meanwhile, the rank and file, under the pretext of fetching some water, slipped into nearby shops, houses and cellars that were left open, as if to treat the passerby. And while there, they bid goodbye, in their own manner, to Mother Moscow. By nightfall, we approached the village of Panki, about 15 versters from Moscow. It was then we saw the fire in the city. It was only the beginning. The fire intensified throughout the night, and by the morning of the 3rd of September, a greater part of the horizon was enveloped in flames. We involuntarily shuddered with surprise and horror. The superstitious, not comprehending what was happening before their eyes, thought that the fall of Moscow signalled the fall of Russia, the triumph of the Antichrist and the impending start of Judgment Day. As the sun set, my friend Figner approached me. Hey, brother Ilya, I want to say goodbye to you. I'm going back to Moscow. If I do not return within a week, do not consider me alive. He shook my hand and disappeared. His words astounded me as much as the Moscow fire did. After resting on the 3rd of September, we resumed our march. The weather was overcast, cold and wet, rather appropriate for the current situation. For six days and six nights, Moscow slowly died, turning to ashes. 
The flames that consumed it left an indelible impression on the minds and feelings of not only the sons of Russia, but the enemy as well. From the moment Moscow turned to ash, political upheavals gradually spread on both continents, old and new world. Thus, in six days, the city that grew and thrived for six centuries disappeared. To soothe the sons of Russia who were distressed by the loss of the capital, the person who was the direct target of soldiers' resentments as the initiator of this endless retreat and the cause of our heavy losses decided to appear in front of the troops. So commander of the First Army, Barclay de Tolly, passed in front of the lines of troops and stopping in front of each regiment made a brief but powerful and inspiring speech. Oftentimes, in the midst of extreme challenges, great sacrifices are needed for great results. It is true that our capital has turned to ash, but you must know that from these ashes the destruction of the enemy and all his forces are born. They are nothing but a band of vagabonds who are hungry for food and plunder. Soon we will witness the destruction of the new Charles XII. Soon he will try to flee from you faster than lightning but will only find death in the Russian realm and his ashes will be scattered under your feet. The last words were spoken with such expressiveness and passion that they seemingly poured into the soldiers' hearts. Soldiers quickly recovered their spirits. Old veterans with long moustaches recalled stories of how their grandfathers had indeed crushed the Swedes at Poltava and thought that Napoleon would share Charles's fate if only they would trust completely in their commander's will and stand firmly to the last drop of their blood. Men no longer grieved for Moscow, saying that our Tsar could turn any town into a capital, just as Peter the Great turned swamps into St. Petersburg. By evening, music began to play in all regiments, songs could be heard and the soldiers' revelry resumed once more. In hindsight, I never felt so good during the entire campaign. From the 23rd of September to the 5th of October, we lived quietly at the Tarantino camp for almost two weeks, without concerning ourselves with the French. We were provided with recruits, horses and ammunition, sheepskin coats, boots and fed biscuits while the horses received plenty of oats and hay. We also received triple payments, and on top of it, the rank and file was given five rubles in paper money for the Battle of Borodino. It was then that everyone truly went on a bender. Peasants from nearby and faraway settlements came to the camp to find their surviving relatives or fellow villagers. Peasant women came daily in droves, bringing goodies to soldiers and seeking their husbands, sons and brothers. I saw many such women driven by militant patriotism and proclaiming, just give us lords pikes and we will go after the French ourselves. It seemed that all of Russia had converged spiritually at our camp. As mornings turned cold in October and cloudy days announced the approach of the cold winter, officers began building dugouts and wear coats. Fires were constantly maintained and, warming up around them, we envisioned the miserable fate of the French in our cold climate. There were rumours that the position of the enemy army was worsening with each passing day. They had consumed all the supplies discovered in Moscow and had no other means of procuring new provisions except by feeding on dead horses. Our fourth corps occupied the enemy bivouacs near the village of Dendi. We were startled to see the remains of horses the French had devoured around their shelters that were made of various doors, tables, etc. We discovered that the French still had some cereals and peas, but lacked bread and beef. We even came across a beautiful black colt with a fine, pebble-grained leather breastplate and bells. Apparently, they were fattening him instead of veal. We marched in the wake of the French on the main Smolensk road and were horrified to see that the roadway had turned into a continuous cemetery, as if a devastating plague had passed through this region. Every verster we encountered several dozen corpses of horses and men, with overturned wagons scattered among them. We saw many frozen horses with their tender parts removed. We even saw, to our amazement, 
one Frenchman lying inside the horse's gut, holding its liver in his hands, apparently intending to devour it. The severe cold had frozen him in this posture, presenting to us the highest degree of human misery. Some unfortunate French soldiers who remained on the road were still alive, but so weakened from complete exhaustion and hunger that they lost their ability to communicate and only their slight hand movements indicated they were still living. We found a blonde officer in this condition in a thin blue uniform and a three-cornered hat, sitting under a tree next to the road. His eyes were half open, his head bent to one side and a deathly pallor covered his handsome face. He did not respond to our questions, but his right hand moved towards his heart. It was clear he was about to leave this world. His eyes suddenly froze, and he died before us. Such horrors which we witnessed throughout our journey after leaving Viasma had a profound and uncomfortable impact on us. Even though the French were our enemies and had devastated our homeland, our thirst for revenge could not overshadow our sense of humanity and compassion to such an extent that we could not commiserate their hardships. I will never forget the night of the 27th of October, which we spent in Dorogabouche. We entered the town after nightfall. I deployed cannon by the side of the road and took quarters in the yard of a house on the outskirts of town. Soldiers spent the night in great misery without tents, warming up by the fire in the open air. As we settled down on frozen ground covered with snow and ignited a bonfire in front of the tent, I looked around and saw numerous corpses of men and horses all around us, dimly lit by the fire. As we had become accustomed to such sights and had more than once enjoyed a sound sleep amidst such a cemetery, forgetting all the prejudices of childhood, we paid no attention to it this time and tried to warm our stiffened limbs. Meanwhile, the light of the fire and the tent, which was set up away from the others, attracted wounded and exhausted Frenchmen. The first to approach us was a tall and skinny German, probably a cavalryman, but we could not discern any uniform on him. We noticed that his legs, for want of shoes, were wrapped in a sack that the wily German tied to his knees, slowly moving towards us like a scarecrow. His contorted face took on a joyful appearance from the wholesome warmth of the fire, especially after we gave him a stale biscuit that we soaked in hot water. We asked him about Napoleon, and as soon as his name was uttered, numerous curses, cursed and damned be he for eternity, poured out of the mouth of this poor man. Soon after him came another one, a true Frenchman in a great coat. He seemed to be more cheerful, though also very fatigued and weak. The tall German stopped cursing Napoleon, and probably out of hatred for the French, stood up, thanked us, and went to look for another refuge. Seeing the Frenchman's futile efforts to gnaw a Russian biscuit, I asked him if he would consider eating horse meat. Why not, he said. There are no limits when it comes to hardship. So I pointed to a nearby horse and suggested that he might be able to satisfy his hunger at once. We gave him an axe. I wanted to see what he would do. The Frenchman, with axe in hand, doddered towards the horse and dropping to his knees began to strike it with all the might that he still had. But the corpse had been petrified from cold. Seeing that it was impossible for him to get any meat, the poor man returned to the fire, and laying down the axe, he said, very calmly, What else to do? One has to die. And lay down on the ground. When we reached the main road from Minsk to Vilna, which our unfortunate enemy used to escape, we encountered numerous overturned wagons, corpses of killed or frozen humans and horses, scattered on and under snow. On one occasion, my cannon got stuck in a pothole and almost turned over. I rushed with my cannoneers to hold it up and was shocked to see that the wheel was, in fact, stuck in between the bones of a frozen corpse. Once we met two Russian women, who, with clubs in hand, were escorting about three dozen ragged and half-frozen Frenchmen. Upon seeing the jubilation of these women as they led their captive enemies, we couldn't help but laugh. But on the other hand, 
we could not but feel sorry upon seeing how humiliated and how disgraced these once proud conquerors of Europe had become. Along the way, we occasionally stopped at taverns and were usually treated to terrible sights inside. Ordinarily, there was a fire in the middle of the room, and frozen Frenchmen lay all around it on the floor. Those closest to the fire were still moving, but the rest were all dead, their bodies distorted and faces disfigured. Such were the calamities that befell Napoleon's great army. On the 10th of December, our artillery stopped at the village of Paradomino, about 15 versters from Vilna. Meanwhile, as the forces of Admiral Chichagov and Count Wittgenstein, as well as other flying detachments, drove the enemy finally out of Russia and pursued his survivors all the way to the Vistula, the main army of the Field Marshal took up winter quarters around Vilna. Thus, peace and order were once again restored, and Russia had risen from her deathbed. While devastation was considerable and especially felt by the poor villagers, such wounds healed little by little, and the losses were soon recouped through hard work and help from the government. Thus, Napoleon's army of half a million men was destroyed, with which he fancied to conquer Russia. Fifty generals and one hundred thousand soldiers ended up prisoners of war, as if to ensure that no future European nation even in alliance with others, would dare to attempt another invasion like this. <laughs>